So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Robert H. Brandenburger, uh, who is a professor at McGill University at Montreal, Canada. Uh, he's a very renowned cosmologist and uh, he worked on many aspects uh, in cosmology and he will uh, provide a very good understanding of inflation and alternative early universe scenarios in the light of uh, swampland criteria which basically came up uh, uh, like uh, two years ago uh, from the perspective of string theory uh, he will give a uh, detailed uh, uh, view of this aspect in the light of inflation and alternatives so thank you, uh, Professor Brandenburger, for agreeing this, uh, agreeing to give this talk. So this is the 30, uh, 35th QSTN seminar, and we welcome you from Potsdam. So you can start the talk. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak. So I'm going to give a fairly provocative talk, and the bottom line, of this talk is going to be that inflation may not be the most promising scenario of our universe cosmology. So that's going to be the bottom line and I'll try to, de to develop towards this message. So I'll first give a lengthy introduction to set the stage. Uh, and the main point that I will make in the introductory section is that there are indeed more than one early universe scenarios which can explain the data. So that's going to be the main point that comes out of section one. Then I'll give a very brief view, review of inflation. And uh, then I will ask the question, which early universe scenario, inflation or one of the alternatives, can be consistently embedded in fundamental theory? So, and there'll be two main issues that I will discuss. So one is called the swampland criteria. Here the assumption is that string theory is the theory that in the ultraviolet unifies all forces of nature. And uh, there are constraints on effective field theories which arise from this starting point. Now the trans cosmic censorship conjecture is much more recent, it is more general. It uh, is a generalization of Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture to cosmology. And it is not just specifically tied to string theory. It is more general. Okay, so the upshot of sections three and four is going to be that there are very serious problems for inflation. If you want inflation to be more than a toy model. And so then, in the later part of the talk, I will turn to two classes of alternative early universe scenarios. One of them is the ekpyrotic bounce. And uh, this is a scenario which people in Potsdam have done quite a bit of work on. And I'll be presenting a new twist to this scenario. And then uh, string gas cosmology is the other scenario. And uh, I will argue that these two scenarios are more easily embedded embeddable in an ultraviolet complete theory. Then I'll conclude. So that's the menu for this afternoon. So let me start with the introduction. So until 1980, we had a nice self-contained classical paradigm of cosmology, where space-time was described by classical general relativity, and matter was described by classical matter, a superposition of cold matter, which forms galaxies, so equation of state pressure equals zero, and radiation which gives you the cosmic microwave background. So equation of state pressure equals one third energy density. So a nice classical scenario. And then the third assumption is that space on large scales is homogeneous and isotropic. And that gives us standard Big Bang cosmology. So just to introduce the basic notation, the space timeline element ds squared is given by dt squared, t is physical time, minus a of t squared, dx squared, 
These X's here are co-moving coordinates, which expand as space expands. And AFT is a scale factor, which describes the size, the physical size of the spatial sections. Okay, so the, this is the basis of standard big bang cosmology. And standard big bang cosmology was very successful because it explained Hubble's discovery that space is expanding as a function of time. It predicted the existence and black body nature of the cosmic microwave background. And it also explains the abundances of light elements. Okay, so according to standard Big Bang cosmology, the universe begins with a singularity. So the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis gives you an artist's impression of the spatial size. So the universe starts with a singularity. 300,000 years after the singularity, the universe has cooled sufficiently such that atoms can form, the microwave background is released, and it is detected today with telescopes. This is a timeline of standard Big Bang cosmology, and the major success is that it explains this beautiful curve. So this is the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. This is wave length. This is intensity, and this curve is the observational curve, including the errors. So this is the first time that cosmology became high precision. So beautiful success of uh, standard big bang cosmology, but we didn't rest there because we realized that standard big bang cosmology did not explain everything. There was no explanation for the large size and entropy of the universe no explanation for the observed spatial flatness. And most importantly, in light of the previous transparency, no explanation for the isotropy of the cosmic microwave background. There, there was also no explanation for the ordinary structure. And there's a singularity at the beginning. So here are, is the illustration of some of the problems. So this is the projection of the sky onto a plane, and color-coded is the intensity of the cosmic microwave background converted to temperature. And you see in different directions of the sky, you see all these different temperatures, which go from zero degrees Kelvin to 3.64 degrees Kelvin. So you see different points on the sky, different temperatures, different colors. So you see an incredible isotopy. Now, if you probe with very high precision, 10 to the minus five, of the monopole, then you see anisotropies popping up. You see hot spots and cold spots. And given this beautiful map, you can expand this map in spherical harmonics and you can plot the power in each spherical harmonic. So this is spherical harmonic. So small angular scales, large angular scales. This is the power. And the data from the previous map is these black dots with statistical errors on small angular scales and a systematic uncertainty on large angular scales. And the red curve is a six parameter fit that describes this fairly well. So now the question I want to ask is who predicted this red curve? And this red curve was in fact first predicted 10 years before inflation. So Robert, I yep. have a question in the previous slide. So when you were uh, explaining this plot, how this angular size and multipoles are connected to each other? So, see so you should view the, so this is a spherical harmonic decomposition. Yeah. And the L gives you sort of the um, resolution of the spherical harmonic. So if you have low L, it means you have poor resolution. That means large angular scale. Okay. So small L, large angular scales. So L equals um, two is the dipole. No, that I know. I'm just saying that is there is any relation, relation, direct relationship between them? That's a relationship. Oh, okay, okay. The relationship is uh, um, L is, 180 degrees divided by the angle times two, something like that. Ah, okay, okay, okay. 
and something said that. Okay. Okay. Good. So since you asked the question, I will not go to the side I was going to go to, but I will show you the horizon problem. So why can't standard Big Bang cosmology explain that the temperature in different directions of the sky, in opposite directions of the sky, is the same? So in this sketch, the horizontal axis is space, the vertical axis is time. We are here today observing microwave photons reaching us from different directions. And this blue line, this blue horizontal line, corresponds to the time of recombination when the microwave background is released. And these are the light cones that can reach these different places on the past, on the last scattering surface, coming from the Big Bang singularity. And as shown in this graph, the, this causal light cone it does not intersect with this causal light cone. And so therefore there is no way for standard Big Bang cosmology to tell us why the temperature at point B should be the same as the temperature at point A. So that's the horizon problem. Now here, um, good. So if there are any graduate students who are listening in, you should pay careful attention to what I'm saying now because I'm going to lie. And you have to figure out where I am lying. And you can't cheat. You can't look at cosmology textbooks because all cosmology textbooks say exactly the same thing that I'm going to say now. Okay. But anyway, here's the argument that I'm trying to develop. So now we want to explain why there are non-random structures in the universe on very large scales. So this axis is time. This axis is space in co-moving coordinates. This is a time of equal matter and radiation. And it is a fact that density perturbations can start to grow only at equal matter and radiation, at least in a particular gauge. Now, this diagonal line is the causal horizon of standard Big Bang cosmology. And I will label it as H inverse of T for reasons that you'll see later. And this vertical line is the length scale on which we want to explain non-random structures. And I didn't cheat when I was drawing this sketch. It is indeed true that if we look on very large scales today, that this length scale is larger than the standard Big Bang horizon at the time of equal matter and radiation. So now you say we have non-random structures today at this scale. The only way that structures can form is by gravity. Gravity is weak. If there are non-random structures today, there have to be non-random structures already at the time, equal matter and radiation, and this is causally impossible. So you see here, I spoke very quickly because I did sneak in two lies, but that's the standard scenario. So the standard scenario is that standard Big Bang cosmology does not provide the possibility of a causal explanation for the structure that we observe in the universe. So standard Big Bang cosmology, although it explains the existence of the microwave background and its black body nature, it does not explain its isotropy and it does not explain any of the structures that we see. So the solution is uh, that, that I'm going to, or that people have uh, pursued, is to modify the evolution of the very early universe. So again, we are working in the framework of, of cosmology, classical general relativity. This is the line element which I already introduced. And h of t, a dot over a, is the Hubble expansion rate. This is going to play a very important role. Robert, sorry for uh, interruption. Just I want to, I know the reason, but I'm just asking to clarify. Since you, will, you are talking about the modified theory, why you haven't considered the spatial, uh, like, uh, the, so you have considered the spatial flatness. So you have taken the parameter k to be zero. Okay. Well, I haven't said that. Here I've said that, yes. Yeah. So okay, the reason I've done it in, in, in this slide is to make the notation simple. But observations tell us 
yeah yeah that's why i'm saying from the observation perspective you have uh, dropped that key right but but uh, this is actually important because i will be dropping it most places and the justification is coming from the present data so we see okay. the okay. universe to be quite flat today yeah. and if it's quite flat today then it's extremely flat in the old universe true and so in my modified theories of the very old universe i will be also worked in the context of especially flat okay. okay but i wouldn't need to do that yeah okay okay okay, okay. good so now i come back to this slide and I want to tell you who first predicted this beautiful curve, who first understood the physics that gives rise to these acoustic oscillations. And this is not the people who developed inflation, but it's actually people who did the work, who studied the physics 10 years earlier. It is Jim Peebles and it is Rashid Zunyayev. There are two papers, both in approximately 1970, one by Zunyayev and Zeldovich, the other one by Peoples and you. And here is a, a, is a very poor rendition of a graph of the first, of the top half of figure one in the Zeldovich Zunyayev paper. So the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is space, again in my co moving coordinates. This diagonal line is the big bang. It's a standard Big Bang horizon. And actually, what they imply by this line is the gene's length, which is the length scale below which fluctuations oscillate above which they grow. And the gene's length dramatically decreases at recombination. So what Zeldovich and Zunyayev and Peebles and you argued is the following. They said, assume that we have a roughly scale invariant spectrum of standing wave inhomogeneities on these large scales. Scales that look like they are a causal from the standpoint of standard big bang cosmology. Okay, so they knew that these fluctuations will not oscillate on scales larger than this gene's length. They will be, remain standing waves, but they will start to oscillate when the wavelength is equal, becomes equal to this uh, length scale. So they will start to oscillate. And you see that depending on the wave number, the wave has done a different number of oscillations between when it enters and recombination. So the wave that enters right at recombination it doesn't have time to do any oscillations. So we catch it at maximum amplitude. The next wave, which has done a quarter of an oscillation, we catch it at minimal amplitude, maximal velocity. So now if we catch an inhomogeneity at maximal amplitude, this gives rise to a maximal redshift, a maximal temperature anisotropy. And so it is this effect which explains the acoustic oscillations in the CMB angular power spectrum. In fact, it predicted the CMB, the acoustic oscillations in the CMB angular power spectrum. So this is 10 years before inflation. So now you see this is figure 1A, and there's a bottom part of figure 1, figure 1B, and uh, figure 1B shows you the matter power spectrum as a function of wave number, and the same oscillations that I described also lead you to oscillations in the matter power spectrum. This is called the barrier acoustic oscillations. So this was all predicted and well understood 10 years before inflation. Okay, I want to emphasize this. Okay, and here I summarize what I've said in words. So now where does this leave inflation? So the one question which Peebles and you and Zeldovich and Sunyayev did not answer is how does one obtain such a spectrum of super Hubble equations? They just said, given such a scale invariant power spectrum, and they knew it was reasonable because it gave you a reasonable power spectrum of galaxies. This was already known in 1970. So this was 
why they proposed the scale bound power spectrum, and then they predicted this and this. But they didn't have a, a mechanism to generate these fluctuations. And indeed, inflationary cosmology is the first scenario based on causal physics, which yields such a spectrum, but it is not the only one. Okay, so now I want to discuss what kind of criteria have to be satisfied for an early universe scenario in order to be successful. So, first of all, I have to distinguish between the horizon and the whole radius. So the horizon is the forward light cone of a point on the initial Cauchy surface. And the horizon tells us about causal contact. In contrast, the Hubble radius, defined as the inverse expansion rate, it's a local concept. And it is relevant for the dynamics of cosmological fluctuations, because if you study the dynamics of cosmological fluctuations, you find that for wave lengths larger than the Hubble radius, the fluctuations do not oscillate. For wavelengths smaller than the Hubble radius, they oscillate. Now, in standard Big Bang cosmology, the Hubble radius is equal to the horizon, and therefore standard Big Bang cosmology cannot explain the structures that we see today. So in any theory which kind of provide a mechanism for explaining the isotopy of the microwave background and for explaining the structures that we see, the Hubble radius has to be different than the horizon. The horizon has to be much bigger. So these are the criteria for a successful early universe cosmology. Horizon has to be much bigger than the Hubble radius. Otherwise, you can't generate isotopy of the microwave background. Now, if you want a causal mechanism of structure formation, then you would like the length scale of perturbations that we see today, you would like that length scale to be smaller than the Hubble radius at early times. Then we can use local causality local causality in time to generate fluctuations. So that's the second criteria. Now, if you assume that the fluctuations are quantum mechanical in origin, then you need a mechanism to convert these quantum fluctuations to classical fluctuations, and a crucial ingredient is squeezing the fluctuations. And finally, if you have a mechanism that satisfies the first three criteria, it also has to produce a scaling down spectrum of curvature fluctuations, almost scaling down spectrum. So these are the four criteria for a successful early universe cosmology. And inflation indeed is a way to realize all four criteria. So this is again a space time sketch. Vertical axis is time, horizontal axis is space. Here I use physical spatial coordinate. And inflation assumes that there's a period in the very early universe where space expands exponentially. Before inflation, there was a pre-inflationary phase which starts with a singularity. So inflation is past incomplete. You have to have something before inflation which has a singularity. Okay, so inflation is a hypothetical period of exponential expansion of space. Exponential expansion of space means that the Hubble radius which is H inverse is constant. But exponential expansion of space means that the horizon also expands exponentially. So therefore there's an exponential difference between horizon and Hubble radius. So first criteria is satisfied. Now, if we look at fluctuations on scales we observe today, this is a red curve. We trace it back to the end of inflation. The length scale is much bigger than the Hubble radius, standard big bang horizon. But since space is expanding exponentially in this phase, as long as this phase is long enough, then this length scale originates from inside of the Hubble radius, and therefore a causal generation mechanism is possible. So second condition satisfied. Now evolution on super Hubble scales gives you the squeezing. Third criterion satisfied. And the time translation variance of the energy density during this phase of exponential expansion gives you the mechanism that generates a scaling variant spectrum of cosmological equations. So what I gave you now is just a heuristic argument and if there are questions later, I can expand on the mathematics. So inflation is good, but there are other things which are good as well. And one thing that's also, that also does a job is a bounce scenario. 
a bounce in cosmology. So here is the scale factor as a function of time in a bounce in cosmology. So we have the bounce point, expansion, contraction. So the universe is assumed to start out in a phase of contraction. Some new physics gives you the bounce, and then you have standard Big Bang-like expansion. And the top is the result in space-time sketch. So time, this is co-moving spatial coordinates. This is a bounce point. This solid curve is the Hubble radius, which is growing linearly in time. And in a symmetric bounce, it is decreasing linearly in time. And this is what co-moving scales do. Their wavelength is constant. Their co-moving wavelength is constant. So time starts at minus infinity. So therefore, the horizon is infinite, infinitely larger than the Hubble radius. Perturbations originate sub Hubble. Perturbations propagate for a long time on super Hubble scales, which gives you the possibility of having squeezing. And well, it turns out that if you start with vacuum perturbations in a single field model, then you find that the fluctuations that result at this bounce point are scaling back. There's a duality between a matter-dominated contraction and an exponentially expanding phase. So all four criteria for a successful early universe cosmology can be also obtained in a bouncing setup. And the third class of models are models which I call emerging scenarios. And here's the scale factor as a function of time. And here we assume that there's a new physics phase Maybe there's a phase in which there is no space-time. There's a phase transition to the phase of standard Big Bang expansion. So this is the background which is hypothesized in the emergent universe. And this is the corresponding space-time sketch. So time and uh, physical spatial distance. Uh, Again, Sir Brandenberger, can I just interrupt for a second? Sure. Yeah. So what you showed now, is that it was possibly before the Big Bang, uh, there was a contracting phase, and then at equal to zero, we started, uh, and, and actually, yeah, then we started again, the universe started expanding. Yep, so I said that you need new physics to get this transition. Yes, some new- and I'll come back to that at the yeah. end of the talk. The, I will talk specifically about a model, which I think is very nice. Good, good. I, I will come to, we'll discuss that, but my present question is that whatever new physics we will discuss there, which will make it expand again, will the same physics not allow any more contraction? Because that we don't observe now. Yes, I'm will talking about single bounce. Single bounce model, yeah. So, so that physics will also tell that it will never have a bounce again. That's correct. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good. Okay, so let me finish with this emergent scenario. In the emergent scenario, there's a quasi-static phase, so wavelengths remain constant. And there's standard big buying expansion where the wavelength of fluctuation expands. Time runs from minus infinity to infinity, so the horizon is infinite, the Hubble radius does this. So you see horizon much, big, much bigger than Hubble radius, fluctuations emerge sub-Hubble, they propagate on super-Hubble scales. So the three first criteria for a successful early universe cosmology are satisfied. And if the fluctuations in this phase have holographic scaling, then you get a scaling band spectrum of cosmological perturbations. Okay, so the bottom line of this part of the talk, this long section, is that there's more than one scenario for early universe cosmology. But we would not just like a scenario, we would like to connect this early universe scenario with a theory. And so let me remind you what is done in inflation. So again, this is what inflation does. I've already said this. So you get inflation by taking space time to be described classically by the einstein hilbert action. And you assume that matter is dominated by a slowly rolling scalar field. 
And it has to be a scalar field and a slowly rolling scalar field because you want to obtain an equation of state pressure almost equal to minus energy density because it, only, it is only if you have such an equation of state that you get something like inflation. So this is the background and in inflation it is assumed that fluctuations start out in the quantum vacuum state. Okay, good, so you have a scalar field. This is the Lagrangian of a scalar field. The, here I wrote down the energy density and the pressure that results from this Lagrangian. And so you, there are three components, three components that contribute to the energy density, kinetic energy, tension energy, and potential energy. And you see that you need potential energy domination if you want P approximately equal to minus one. So therefore, you first of all, you need potential energy, but you need the slope of the potential to be very slow, very shallow, such that the scalar field will move very slowly. Good. So this is the equation of motion of a scalar field, and you want slow motion. So you need this condition on the slope of the potential. The slope of the, the derivative of the potential, V prime is dV by d phi. V prime over V times M Planck has to be much, much smaller than one. And this condition has to be satisfied not just at one time, but for over a long time interval. And therefore you need this condition, a condition on the second derivative. It has to be very small in magnitude. And finally, if you want the trajectory that solves this equation to be a local attractor in initial condition space, then you need to evolve over a large field range. So the field range delta phi has to be bigger than M Planck. So the conditions for successful inflation in this canonical setup is you need to have access to large field ranges, shallow potentials, and no tachyonic behavior. Okay. Good. So inflation, in my view, is self-consistent as an effective field theory, as a toy model. But does it actually emerge from an ultraviolet complete theory? Okay, and so now for the students in the audience, I should warn you that I'm going to make a transition between things which are absolutely uh, accepted to things which are controversial. So now we'll come things that are controversial, but I hope to make good arguments for them. So I'm going to ask, does inflation, can inflation emerge from an ultraviolet complete theory? Okay, and there are two sets of obstacles to that. One of them comes from superstring theory, it goes under the name swampland conjectures, and the other one comes from more general quantum gravity considerations. It's a trans planckian censorship conjecture. And I'll turn to them in turn. So, first of all, swampland criteria. Okay, so if you just work with effective classical field theories. So you have classical fields, then you have a huge landscape of possibilities. Any space-time dimension goes, any number of fields, any shape of the potential, any field range, everything is self-consistent. And I emphasize self-consistent. So you can postulate any scale factor and you can design the scalar field to give you that scale factor and you learn absolutely nothing. So therefore you would really like this effect of field theory to come from some fundamental theory. So now, in spite of the bad press among many people, super string theory is actually very constrained it says that only a very small subset of all possible effective field theories is consistent as opposed to self-consistent. The rest lie in the swampland. So there's this very nice picture. In green, you see this huge uh, set of possible effective field theories. Here you have this unique ultraviolet complete theory. And if you look at various limits of this unique theory, you get different effective field theories, but just small islands in this huge. So it tells us that there's a small landscape of effective field theories which stick out in this out of the swamp, 
which are livable. And what are the criteria for the factor field theories which are consistent with string theory? So what are conditions for habitable islands sticking out from the swamp? So first of all, the effective field theory can only be valid over field ranges which is smaller than order one parameter times n Planck. That's a field range condition. And potentials are constrained because potentials come from string theory. They, for example, they come from effects that stabilize the extra dimensions. So potentials are not arbitrary. In fact, the slope of the potential in Planck units has to be sufficiently large. The slope of the, of the, the relative slope of a scale of your potential in Planck units has to be bigger than order something of order one. And, or actually, if there's a local uh, extremum of the potential, then this local extremum has to be sufficiently tachyonic. So these are the conditions on viable effective field theories to be consistent with string theory. And let's just compare that again with inflation. Okay, so inflation says very shallow potential, no tachyonic behavior, small field range, a large field range. So these are opposite to these criteria. So therefore, you conclude that canonical slow roll inflation is in the swampland. It is inconsistent with string theory. False vacuum inflation is in the swampland as well. However, not all inflation models are in the swampland. Warm inflation can escape from the swamp. Okay. So this is one set of constraints on early universe cosmology models. Now I turn to the other set of constraints which are more general than coming from string theory. This is the transplanking censorship conjecture. And this is based on work that Jerome Martin and I did a long time ago, 20 years ago. We realized that there's a, what we at that point called transplantian problem for inflation. So this is the space-time diagram of inflation, which you already saw. So this is the period of inflation where space expands exponentially. During this phase of exponential expansion, the wavelength of perturbations we see, it contracts exponentially. And it is good because we want the length scale to be smaller than the inflationary Hubble radius. But if inflation lasts too long, then you see that the scale of the perturbations emerges from wavelengths smaller than the Planck length. And effective field theories are definitely inapplicable on these scales. So we realize that new physics must enter into the calculation of fluctuations. So now when I gave this talk, uh, a similar talk to this one, last summer at a superspring uh, workshop at Stony Brook, Vafa and his student Bedroya said, well, this sounds like there's a principle. And so they turned this transplantian problem for fluctuations in inflation into a transplantian censorship conjecture, TCC. And the conjecture reads that no transplantian modes can ever exit the Hubble horizon. So again, this is the uh, framework of homogeneous and asymptotic cosmology. The Hubble horizon is the inverse of H. So what Bedroya and Waffa are saying is that if at some initial time you take the Planck length and you follow the physical wavelength of the Planck corresponding to the Planck length until a later time T sub r, then this length scale has to remain smaller than the Hubble radius at this later time. So this is the mathematical form of the transplantian censorship conjecture. Okay, so now let me try to justify this conjecture. And I'll give you two justifications. One is in analogy with what Penrose said about black holes. So here you have a, a usual uh, diagram of a black hole, Schwarzschild black hole, or a black hole with charge smaller than a mass. So this is a real and this is the temporal direction for the outside observer. And for a black hole with a small charge, there is a horizon. 
Now there's a singularity, you see, but an observer at infinity does not see this singularity. The observer at infinity is shielded from the singularity by the horizon. Now, if you just take general relativity, general relativity is an effective field theory, then general relativity allows for solutions with charge bigger than the mass. And for these Faraday symmetric solutions with charge greater than the mass, there is no horizon that shields the observer from the singularity. In fact, in this case, the singularity is time-like, not space-like as in the other case. So the poor observer cannot set up a Cauchy problem and the poor observer is influenced by this singularity. So what Penrose said is, well, the effective field theory can admit these pathological solutions, but the full theory cannot. The full theory has to have things that prohibit these pathological solutions. So general activity allows for solutions with time-like singularities, but the conjecture is that ultraviolet physics says that these time-like singularities have to be hidden by a horizon. So now, one way to motivate the TCC is by just um, generalizing Penrose's arguments in the following way. We will replace the singularity of a black hole by the transplancian region in cosmology. And we will replace the black hole horizon by the Hubble horizon. So if we then translate what Penrose says, is Penrose will say, the observer who measures physics on scales outside of the Hubble horizon must be shielded from modes which were transplanted at any time. So this is the, one of the motivations for the transplanted cosmic censorship. So now the one thing which I didn't explain yet is why do I take the Hubble horizon to generalize the black hole horizon? So and the reason for that is the following. I already told you about fluctuations. I already told you that fluctuations don't grow, they don't freeze out, <clears throat> and they are not squeezed on sub hubble scales. They just oscillate. So, um, well, if we have things from the Planck region that uh, enter, that remain sub hubble they will never grow to be classical. So that's not a problem, or not necessarily a problem. So therefore, we demand, we demand something conservative. We just say that the classical region, the region where fluctuations can grow, that should be insensitive to transplanting jump. So this is one justification for the TCC. Now, another justification comes from the non-unitarity of effective field theory in an expanded universe, something that was discussed by Nathan Weiss in 1985 in this work, D article. So if you view an, an effective field theory, you need an ultraviolet cutoff. And uh, you can view the Hilbert space as the product Hilbert space of harmonic oscillator Hilbert spaces, one harmonic oscillator Hilbert space for each co-moving wave number. Co-moving wavelength is important. But the, cultural, the ultraviolet cutoff has to be at a fixed physical scale. So if you want to maintain the physical scale, the constant physical scale of the ultraviolet cutoff, in light of the fact that the universe is expanding, you will need to generate modes continuously. So this is extreme violation of unitarity. And if we want to shield the classical region from this non-unitarity, then none of these modes that you have to generate can leave the egg Hubble horizon. So I was quite explicit. I spent quite a bit of time on this justification because this justification does not appear in the publications in this way. Okay, so now let's apply the transplanting censorship conjecture to early universe models. Let's apply to inflation. So this is a space-time gram of inflation, which you've already seen many times, time and space, physical spatial direction. This is length, this is the Hubble radius, beginning of inflation, end of inflation. And well, 
In this diagram, I drew the period of inflation to be exactly long enough to saturate the TCC. So if inflation is any longer than I drew, then an initial plunk length will become larger than the Hubble radius. Okay. So inflation is possible. It can be consistent with the TCC, provided it doesn't last long. But if inflation is to be successful, then our current Hubble radius has to start out inside of the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. And that means that inflation has to last sufficiently long. So there are two constraints on successful inflation. It has to last sufficiently long such that the present Hubble radius starts out inside the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. And it cannot last too long because we can't have the initial plunk length become super Hubble. Okay, so now you see that the value of this length scale is determined by the energy scale of inflation. The higher the energy scale of inflation, the larger the hub, the higher the energy scale of inflation, the smaller the Hubble radius, and the more constraining these criteria are. The lower the energy scale of inflation, the larger the Hubble radius and the easier uh, it is to satisfy these two criteria. So let's do the mathematics. This is the TCC constraint, the upper bound on the duration of inflation. And this is the lower bound on the duration of inflation, which comes from demanding that our current Hubble radius starts out at the beginning of inflation, T sub star, inside the Hubble radius. Okay? So now the, the, a couple of lines of algebra tell you that this gives you an upper bound on the energy scale of inflation. The energy scale of inflation cannot be larger than three times 10 to the nine GV. Compared to 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 GV in canonical models of inflation. Now the energy scale of inflation gives you the amplitude of the gravitation wave, which are predicted. So any inflationary model which is consistent with the transparent and cosmic censorship provides an extremely small amplitude of gravitation waves. The amplitude of gravitational waves divided by the amplitude of cosmological perturbations, the famous tensor to scalar ratio, is smaller than 10 to the minus 30. So people usually say that inflation is nice because it predicts a large amplitude of the spectrum of gravitational waves. Well, unfortunately, this is completely wrong. Inflationary models, which are consistent with the transparent censorship conjecture, predict negligible amount of gravitational waves. In fact, the gravitational waves will be dominated by the secondaries. Okay, so now it is actually difficult in this setup of low scale inflation to get sufficiently large uh, cosmological perturbations need an extremely small slow roll parameter and therefore you have fine tuning of initial conditions. So even low scale inflation is finely tuned. So not good news for inflation. So the swamp line criteria seem to tell you that canonical inflation is inconsistent with string theory and the TCC seems to tell you that only very low scale inflation has a chance of working and this is fine tuned. Okay now what, about, what does the TCC tell you about alternative cosmologies? Well Bouncing cosmology is absolutely no constraint. As long as the energy scale of the bounce is larger than the Planck scale, then scales that we observe today never come close to the trans region. So bouncing cosmologies are completely consistent with the TCC, as this space time time diagram shows. Emergent cosmologies are completely consistent with the TCC, as this type space time diagram shows. It is only early universe models which have exponential expansion which are in trouble. So it is a basic mechanism that gives you exponential expansion. That's the thing that is giving you the problems. Okay, so preliminary conclusions. Inflation does not naturally emerge from superstring theory. Only low scale inflation is 
consistent with the TCC, and that is highly fine-tuned. So now, what about alternatives to inflation? Can they emerge from an ultraviolet complete theory? Okay, and I will end with showing two scenarios which naturally emerge from superstring theory. And one of them realizes a bouncing scenario, the other one realizes an emergent scenario. So first of all, the first one, the bouncing scenario is the ectorotic bounce. So now the basis of the ectorotic bounce is the assumption that space-time is described by the einstein hilbert action. And what we want is we want the universe to start in a phase of very slow contraction. And this is given by matter with an equation of state, W, which is pressure divided by energy density, much larger than one. And this can be obtained by using a scalar field with a negative exponential potential. And now negative exponential potentials are ubiquitous in string theory. And for people who don't believe that, I refer them to the textbook by Baumann and McAllister. Now among bouncing cosmologies, the ectorotic scenario has major advantages because NS autopies are diluted, spatial flatness is created like inflation. It is a local attractor in initial condition space like inflation. In fact, it might even be a global attractor. And this I already said. So among bouncing cosmologies, ectorotic scenarios have a preferred status. Okay, so this is the kind of potential that we use to get ectorotic contraction, a negative exponential potential. If we want to get a particular equation of state, W, W is four over three P, we need P to be small, and you see that means that the potential has to be steep. And if you then look at the time evolution of a scalar field, you get this solution. And if you look at how much the scalar field changes over one Hubble time, you find that it changes over a very little amount which is what I wrote here. So, small field range, steep potential, and the second derivative of the potential is large. So these are completely consistent with the small plan criteria. So the potentials which are used in the ectorotic scenario are completely consistent with string theory, completely consistent with the small plan criteria. So this is good news for the ectorotic scenario. However, the ectorotic scenario had challenges, namely how do we get this bounce? And I promise to come back to the bounce. And how do we obtain a scaling invariant spectrum of curvature perturbations? And do we obtain gravitational waves of significant amplitude on cosmological scales? Okay, and uh, in previous work, one had to do all kinds of strange things to get a bounce when needed extra scalar fields to get the scaling around spectrum of curvature perturbations, and one got completely negligible amplitude of gravitational waves. Now what we did is we added a very small ingredient to the ekparotic scenario, which is called an S-brain. And we found that using this one new ingredient, we automatically get a bounce. We automatically get a scaling around spectrum of curvature perturbations, we automatically get a large amplitude spectrum of gravitational waves, and we get two specific consistency relations for cosmological observables. So, okay. And so this is a preview for our consistency relations. We get a roughly scaling around spectrum of perturbations for both uh, density perturbations and gravitational waves. And this is the consistency relations between the deviations of the slopes from being uh, zero. So the scalar slope is related to the tensor slope this way, and this is the uh, result for R. So unless there are um, people who do data analysis, I won't dwell on these predictions. Okay, and finally, this s brain also gives you the transition between the scalar field dominated phase of contraction and a radiation dominated phase of expansion. Okay. So the idea is the following. You take a contracting universe when matter is low energy degree of freedom from series, the scalar field, 
the universe is contracting, it's heating up, eventually the energy density gets close to the string scale. And at that point, you cannot neglect other degrees of freedom that string theory has. They become equally massive as the degrees of freedom which were low energy. And you have to include them in the low energy effective action. And there are something that you have to include exactly at the time that you hit the density, the string density. So it's a term that you have to include in the low energy effect of action. You have to include it at one particular time. So it is a delta function source in time. And this gamma is sort of the tension of the brain. Sorry, so kappa is the tension of the brain and gamma is the induced metric on the brain. So this is the one little ingredient that we added to the ekpyrotic scenario. So, uh, Robert, I have a question. So, yeah. how this is different from this uh, Randall syndrome single? It's brain completely model? different because in Randall syndrome, the brains are are time-like. Ah, okay, okay. This is a space-like brain. Okay, okay, okay. Now, S brains were, I think, first introduced by. Um, Good pal and Strominger. Ah, uh, okay. Maybe, maybe they were introduced earlier. So now if you look at the equation of state, which this term has, well, this term has vanishing energy density and it has negative pressure. So it has vanishing energy density because the energy density is the component of T mu, which is perpendicular to the brain in time direction. And there's nothing in time direction. So like if you take a domain wall, a domain wall has vanishing pressure in the orthogonal direction. So therefore the S brain has vanishing energy density. And it is a brain that has tension, tension is negative pressure. And so this is something that violates the null energy condition. And you see immediately that it can mediate a transition between contraction and expansion. Okay, so let's show that. So, um, the S brain affects the background in a way that can be modeled by matching um, an expanding post bounce uh, cosmology to a contracting pre bounce cosmology, and by using continuity of the induced metric and the jump of the extrinsic curvature given by the tension of the S brain. So these are the Israel matching conditions rotated by 90 degrees in phase space, as discussed by Doriel and Mukhanov, and uh, also in a very nice paper by uh, Dora and Danitsi. And so these matching conditions tell you that the change in H, the change in the Hubble expansion rate across the brain is given by this tension, and it is positive. So it can mediate the jump from something negative to something positive. And so if we, Therefore, as long as the tension of the brain is large enough, we automatically get a bounce. A bounce, it is a non-singular bounce, but it is not a continuous bounce. Okay, so now we have to look at what perturbations do. So let's look at gravitation waves passing through this bounce, and they satisfy this equation of motion. There is a term, which is a delta function source, so essentially, you have a harmonic oscillator equation with a single time perturbation to the mass. And I was very surprised when my student Z-Way came to me and told me that modes going through this bounce obtain very interesting Bogolyubov coefficients, Bogolyubov coefficients which go as 1 over k. So again, we have this... Um, equation of motion for a harmonic oscillator in the presence of this uh, one-time uh, contribution to the mass. The solutions are plane waves for times before the bounce, plane waves for times after the bounce. There are uh, mic matching conditions that you can impose and or you can treat this as a distributional equation and you can solve it exactly in terms of generalized functions you can find the Bogolyubov coefficients which relate the dominant mode in the uh, post-bounce phase to the, dominant, to the dominant mode in the pre-bounce phase. 
And to cut things short, you find that the bubble of coefficients are some constant over k. So the smaller the, the larger the wavelength, the more boosted the perturbations are. And this is exactly the beta coefficients which turn the vacuum spectrum into a scaling vacuum. Sorry, Robert, can I interrupt for a minute here now? Yeah. We introduced an S brain. Yeah. Okay. And then you're writing. Here. Yes, you introduced your S brain, but you are writing a four dimensional action. You are not saying anything about how you stabilize the modulus fields now. How I stabilize what? Modulus fields. S brain is a 10 dimensional solution, right? A 10 dimensional. Uh, you're, you're now talking about the real 10 dimensional stringy origin. Otherwise, in four dimensional theory, where do I get an S brain? The S brain is unstable. It is unstable, but and it's it is. So, so what, what happens, and this is the latest paper that I wrote on this with uh, Keshav Gupta and Z Wei Wang. Mm -hmm. the, the contracting universe excites an unstable D4 brain. And it is the decay of this unstable D4 brain which then produces the radiation. So this well, S brain is indeed, that it, you see this S brain, and the reason why it only exists at one point in time is that it is not stable. Simple. The moment you say that, so before, before the bounce took place, we were living also in a higher dimension, which admits a D4 brain solution. That's right. Admits an S brain solution, right? That's right. So you have exactly. to justify that. Exactly. Okay. That in, because we are starting in the contracting phase, the energy density is increasing, the fluctuations are increasing, you have enough energy eventually to produce this object which in vacuum is unstable. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, but for details, I refer you to this later. Sure, sure. I will have a look at it. I'm not seeing. Okay. Good. Okay, so I showed you how the background works. Here I show you how the gravitational waves work. And the key thing is that this is then the formula that we get for the spectrum of gravitational waves. It's a scale advanced spectrum of gravitational waves with an amplitude which is um, not too small. This is the string tension given by the string tension by the string scale. This is the Planck scale. So this power spectrum is suppressed by a couple of powers of uh, string scale divided by Planck scale. And if you look at the tilt, this gives you a uh, blue tilt, but Q is very small, so it gives you a small blue tilt. So this is a calculation of um, the gravitational waves. Then you can look at cosmological perturbations. I don't want to bore you with that. The upshot is that cosmological perturbations also acquire a scale invariant spectrum. And uh, here the tilt is red. And we again have an amplitude, which is determined by the string scale and the Planck scale, by the ratio of these two scales with a power that is different than the amplitude of gravitational waves. And so therefore, if you combine our result for cosmological perturbations with our result for gravitational waves, then you find these two consistency relations, and these are predictions for cosmological observations. So, this concludes my discussion of the ekpyrotic scenario. Um, okay, the bottom line is that the, um, among balancing cosmologies, the ekpyrotic scenario is, has a very special status. The ekpyrotic scenario seems to be completely consistent with string theory, and you seem to get a bounce by adding this S brain, and you do get a large amplitude of gravitational waves. So I want to end with a brief discussion of an emergent setup. And this is actually my favorite setup, which is string gas cosmology. And here we are intrinsically starting from string theory. We are saying that there's a background, a cosmological background, and in this background we have a gas of strings. And this gas of strings is very different from a gas of point particles, because strings have states which point particles do not have. Strings have moment have uh, oscillatory modes like oscillations on guitar strings and strings wide space
they have wine emotes. Corn apples don't have oscillator emotes and they don't have wine emotes, they only have momentum emotes. So there are new degrees of freedom which this gas of strings has, which gases of point particles never could be modeled as having. Now, if you look at these two equations, you see that there's a symmetry between R and one over R. If you replace R and one over R, and at the same time, you replace the momentum and winding quantum numbers, then you have a duality of a spectrum of string states. So you have a new symmetry, which is this key duality symmetry here. Okay, a string gas cosmology is based on these key springy ingredients, but it is a toy model. And this toy model is motivated by string thermodynamics in a compact space. So if you look at a compact space of radius R, and you have a gas of strings, and you look at the temperature of this gas of strings, gas of closed strings, then you compress the box, but in contrast to point particle gases, the temperature of a string gas can never exceed a limiting temperature. So you start with a large box, you compress the box, temperature rises, temperature levels off because you produce oscillator modes, you compress the box even further beyond the string scale, then the energy can flow into the Rhine modes and the temperature will decrease. No temperature singularity. So if you look at temperature as a function of time, you have two possibilities. Either you get a bouncing, a temperature bounce, or you get a setup where the temperature starts constant. You start out in this phase, which we call Hagedorn phase, and then there's a phase transition which gives rise to this decrease. Okay, now another argument that tells you that you can never model early universe spring cosmology using effective field theory is the following, and this again comes from this early paper, Kumun Buffer. But so if you look at quantum field theory of point particles, then the position operator is dual to the momentum operator. It's given by the Fourier transform. But now in, for strings, we have something that's dual to momentum, namely winding. So we can use the winding number eigenstates to construct the dual position operator. Now, if you take a box of large radius, then the momentum modes are light, the winding modes are heavy. So an experimentalist will never see these position operators, will only see these position operators. In contrast, if we take an extremely small box, then the momentum modes are heavy, the winding modes are light. And therefore, we will only see the x tailors and never the x's. But if we are at the symmetry point, and in cosmology, we inevitably will reach a symmetry point. Then the P's and the W's are comparable in mass. And therefore, the X's and the X tilts are comparable. And therefore, you see that no effective field theory in nine plus one dimensions will ever be able to describe the cosmology correctly. If it is an effective field theory, it will have to be an effective field theory in 18 spatial dimensions, two times nine. Okay. So, um, so I argue that this gas of strings has no temperature singularity. Now I'll briefly argue that an experimentalist will never see zero length. And I'll do the argument as follows. You take this box of strings of radius r, and uh, as R, if R is big, then the physical, um, uh, the experimentalist will measure length in terms of R and will measure this. But if R is not small, then one, the observer will measure R in terms of one of R, length in terms of one of R and will measure this. And so what the physical, uh, um, what the experimentalist will measure is a length, a physical length, if the box size decreases, which never goes, becomes zero. So I think it is clear that string theory has the potential to provide a non-singular cosmology, but it is a non-singular cosmology which you will not see without truly stringy ingredients. And my S string was a truly stringy ingredient. Okay. So now if you look at the gas of strings, so you take a background with a gas of strings of all,
you assume that all, all nine dimensions of space are tori, then you will find that only three dimensions of space can ever become large because it is only in three dimensions of space that winding modes can annihilate. And in order for spatial dimensions to become large, the winding modes have to annihilate. And the remaining spatial dimensions are stabilized at the self-dual scale by the interaction of winding modes and momentum modes. So the message for experts here is that if you keep the string winding and momentum modes, so if you keep key duality, if you keep the string ingredients, modular stabilization is very easy. And the only modulus that you have trouble stabilizing is the dilaton. And if you do that with gate genome conjugation, then you can stabilize the dilaton consistent with radion stabilization and uh, shape modular stabilization. And this also gives you high scale supersymmetry breaking. Now, what about cosmology? So this is the emerge, this is the space time picture. We have this emergent phase, the string gas. There's a phase transition. Three dimensions of space can start to become large. They are dominated by radiation because the decay of string winding modes produces radiation. So we automatically get this transition between this emergent phase and the radiation phase. And now what I will show you at the end of my talk is how thermal fluctuations of strings in this phase, how that produces fluctuations that we can observe today with this scanning band spectrum. So the method that we use is the following. It's a three-step method. We first compute the matter perturbations in this emergent phase. That's step one. Step two is mode by mode, we convert the matter perturbations to metric perturbations when they exit the Hubble radius. And then we evolve the fluctuations using perturbed Einstein equations on super Hubble scales. So this is three-step procedure. The bottom line is we use the standard theory of cosmological perturbations, but with thermal initial conditions as opposed to vacuum, and with thermal string fluctuations and not thermal particle fluctuations. Okay. So what we want to compute is we want to compute the cosmological perturbations and the gravitational waves. And the way that we get the cosmological perturbations and the gravitational waves from the energy density and off diagonal pressure perturbations is given by this. So these are the perturbed Einstein equations. Good, so now we look at string thermodynamics and string thermodynamics tells us what these expectation values are. Okay, let's look at the energy density fluctuations. So if you have thermal fluctuations, the energy density fluctuations are always given by the specific heat capacity. R is the radius of the volume that we're interested in. Now, if you have strings as opposed to point particles, then the specific heat capacity is given by this formula. And it is given by R squared, not R cubed. This is holographic scaling of the specific heat capacity. And the way you can understand that is that strings in three dimensions are similar to point particles in two dimensions. Point particles in two dimensions have a specific heat capacity going as R square, and therefore for closed strings in three dimensions, you should get this. But you can also do the real calculation when you get this. And you also get the amplitude, not just the scale. So specific heat capacity, energy density fluctuations, you can compute the uh, cosmological perturbations. And this is the resulting power spectrum of cosmological perturbations. It is the amplitude and the slope. It is given by the ratio of the Planck scale to the string length, and by how different the temperature is in this early phase from the maximum temperature. So you get a scale band spectrum like for inflation, you get a red tilt like for inflation. And if you use the value of the string length, which was suggested in the Bible of string theory of the 1980s, the Greek schwarz witten textbook, then the amplitude is exactly the right amplitude that you need for observation. So now let's look at gravitational waves. There we have to compute the off diagonal pressure perturbations, which are given by this. This is also holographic scaling. And we stick that into the previous formula that relates uh, off diagonal pressure perturbations to gravitational wave perturbations, and we get this result. Now, let me compare with 
to equate for space, the derivations are this one minus t over t sub h in the denominator, whereas gravitational waves have it in the numerator. This leads you to a suppression of gravitational waves compared to scalar cosmological perturbations and to a blue tilt as opposed to a red tilt. So again, we have a very specific prediction for the observables. Namely, we have the blueness of the tensor tilt equals the redness of the scalar tilt. Now, to obtain these um, predictions, all we need from this early universe phase is we need thermality. Actually, we don't even need thermality. All we need is uh, correlation functions, which are this holographic scale. So any emergent cosmology, which has a phase transition from the emergent phase to standard big bang phase of expansion, as long as the correlation functions have holographic scaling, you will get exactly the predictions which I talked about for string gas cosmology. Okay, so you see, this is a toy model, but it is a toy model which is, comes from real stringy ingredients. So it's obviously consistent with string theory at the level of effective field theories. So, it is consistent with the swamp line criteria. We can show that the potentials for modular stabilization are completely consistent with the swamp line criteria. One paper is already out where we discussed um, size moduli and the paper which will come out within a couple of weeks will show the color will, will show the shape moduli it emerges on string theory considerations i've already shown that is it is consistent with the tcc so therefore it is in good shape so now i come to the conclusions final conclusions and you should take that with a grain of salt i intend to be provocative so inflation does not naturally emerge from super string theory if you assume the validity of the trans Planckian cosmic censorship conjecture, inflation is not prohibited, but it is highly fine tuned. In contrast, ectorotic cosmology and string gas cosmology are consistent with both the swamp line criteria and with the TCC. So, therefore, alternatives to inflation appear more promising in light of fundamental physics than inflation. So, thank you for listening. And I expect many questions now. Yeah, so please ask questions and thank you to the uh, speaker, Robert, for okay. giving such a nice uh, overview on the subject. Now, uh, you can't randomly ask. You have to raise your hand and then I will uh, uh, allow you because not like that. Uh, raise your hand uh, electronically. So there is an option to raise the hand. Go to the participants. Go to the participants. And then there is an option called raise your hand. Oh, I don't know how to go there. I'm raising my hand. Can you see? Yes, I can see. Yeah. So will you please do that? Yes. Robert, I'm very thankful to you. You described from before 90s till 2020 whatever you have learned from string theory, swamp land, et cetera. The only question I have is that, uh, whichever you the, the string gas model didn't depend at all on bouncing cosmology. No, it did not. It's, see, when I, already at the end of the introduction, yeah. I, I said there are, there are various alternative scenarios. One of them is bouncing, and yeah. the other one is something like emergent. That's right. So you see, the ectorotic is an example of bouncing, yeah. maybe the most promising. And yeah. spin gas cosmology is an example of, uh, of emergence. Even if I take the ectorapodis and, and consider the bouncing, I should have one theory which will describe to me the earlier one bounce and I have to explain why only one bounce, why was not there multiple bounce, what is the physics, which made me, after the bounce is over, the present universe we are observing through the CNB, etc. Because I have no idea before bouncing, what was the power spectrum, etc. We have no idea. It's right. only... Let me, let me expand on that. 
yeah, yeah. So I I take a point in that I always like to start with the Cauchy problem. Okay. So in terms of your initial condition question, yes, I would say we are assuming. So when I was talking about the ectorotic bounds, yeah, I will start with a homogeneous and isotropic contracting background with yeah. fluctuations in the vacuum state. But now you see that uh, I also mentioned that the ectorotic contraction is a local attractor in initial condition space. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to be that as conservative as I just stated. So one has to give initial, initial conditions. So yes. now let's look after the bounds. Yeah. Uh, you see, given our observations today, we are now in a phase of acceleration. Yes. So now, in order to answer the question, what will happen in the future, I need yeah. to understand the physics of that. Yes. And my, what I, I can't see how you will get a contraction coming out okay. of it. Okay. So I, okay. I, I think that the universe will... That part we are assuming we don't understand how the contraction came. Is that correct? Yes, I put it in as an initial condition. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Now, one of the reasons why I don't like cyclic models. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another issue which I have really reservation about that. See, if you, if you take a four dimensional cyclic model, yeah. then you can show that the spectrum of cosmological perturbations changes in each cycle. Yes. No, not by a small amount, by, by the index changed by two. Yes. Yeah. And so therefore, you really, I, I'm in a bad shape because, yes. Yes. because I can't make any predictions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because in each cycle, I get different predictions. Yes. So basically, as I understand, we cannot go for cyclic universe, but one bounce cosmology is still acceptable, but we are giving our initial condition for one bounce to happen and explain the future. Do I understand correctly? That's right. That, that's, my, that's my view, but, but I'm taking a conservative point of view. <laughs> talk to some people who do quantum cosmology, they would probably, yeah. they would say that I'm too conservative. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so anyway, we all have to live in the same universe. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully yes. I answered your question. Yeah, no, yes, yes. I understood the question. Yeah, yeah. Then the only thing is that we have been long time worrying about initial condition for inflation, but now we have replaced by initial condition of the one bounce cosmology to take place. That's right, that's right. And now you see, since we have to worry about initial conditions, yeah. Again, I will take a, a conservative point of view. I would like my initial conditions to be a local attractor in phase space. No, that, that's okay. That's okay. That's acceptable. Too. Right. And now, large field inflation is a local attractor in field space. Yes. Small field inflation, not. But you know, large field inflation uh, invites Gaussianity, etc. Uh, there is another issue also there, right? We have to worry about that. Well, it's, it's not consistent with the swamp line criteria. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's right. Swamp line is something the thing is different, yes. But swamp land conjectures, etc., also, also has to answer these questions. Why do we have to start with homogeneous in isotropic inverse? That's an assumption. I don't see actually how swamp land criteria can put any light on assuming that there is a homogeneous and isotropic inverse. No, no, but the swamp line criteria are con criteria on the effect of potential. That yeah, is that's independent of, that's completely independent of a cosmology. Yes, okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Thank you. I agree. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. So I'm going to go to the audience for other questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there are other questions. Yeah, so, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so it was I, a nice talk, Robert. I haven't asked. Hello? Yes. I haven't asked you. If I lower the hand, then you will ask. 
Okay, okay. I, I did, didn't know. I see it's raised, so I thought uh, I'm the one. Yeah, please ask now. Okay, so uh, if I remember correctly, in case of inflationary cosmology, we have a thermodynamic argument, right? Like uh, the universe started with a very low entropy state, and as it expands towards the uh, lambda CDM model, it it is basically approaching a thermal equilibrium. So, is there a corresponding thermodynamic uh, argument for the contracting part of the uh, bouncing paradigm? Okay, so I don't quite agree with you in what you said. In fact, uh, the you see today we are not in thermal equilibrium. No, we are the not. Entropy, uh, the entropy of our the entropy of our universe today is is much much smaller than it could have been this is penrose's objection to inflation actually so from penrose's point of view now it, it is true that inflation generates a huge amount of entropy because of the exponential expansion of space and the fact that um, that the energy debt that the energy during inflation increases exponentially and is all dumped into radiation and entropy afterwards so, um, good, so, so anyway, so um, today our universe is not in thermal equilibrium. Now in a contracting universe, you, again, you can not assume that the universe starts in thermal equilibrium. Because I think then you would immediately get upon contraction, you get a gas of black holes. So you can still, yeah, right. you, you can still take a background and in that background, you can consider thermal fluctuations. You, you can do that if you want. Okay. But what we do in the, what, what is usually done in bouncing cosmologies, you start with vacuum perturbations. Now in the ekparotic phase, of, in the ekparotic bounce, since you have a, a, an, an attractor, even if you start with thermal junk at the beginning of a phase of ekparotic contraction, that thermal junk will redshift and we will never see it today. And it's a similar argument to inflation you could imagine that at the beginning of inflation, you have some thermal junk around, in addition to the scalar field. The thermal junk will redshift, leaving you with the scalar field, which looks like it's in a vacuum state. So the situation in the ekparotic phase of contraction and in exponential, in, in exponential inflation is the same. Okay, and one more question is, uh, I think I did not understand correctly. Uh, how is the ekpyotic contraction phase, which is dominated by a uh, super stiff fluid, is uh, smoothly trans transiting to the bouncing phase? Is it, uh, I mean, are okay, you, uh, it is not smoothly, yeah. the, the transition is not s smooth, but it is continuous. Okay. So let me show you. Yes, please can you show once again. Okay, so here I show you the Lagrange, the action in terms of which we do the calculation. So now with this, um, so that's the, the bounce happens at time tau b. And this extra term, is important only at tau b. So the way to obtain the post-bounce universe from the pre-bounce universe is to match, to you apply the matching conditions at this, uh, at this brain. And these are the matching conditions. 
continuity of the induced metric in the curve, which is given by the tension of the S brain. So the metric is the scale factor is continuous, but H jumps. So it is a non-singular, okay. but discontinuous background. Uh, I see. Now, in reality, okay. the yes yeah. spring will have string thickness. And so if you, if you really work on string scales, then you will, st you will, you will get a, uh, a smooth bounce. Okay. And at the level so, I mean, uh, if you go beyond classical level, you can, uh, I mean, try to achieve smooth bounce. Even at the, if you go beyond effective field theory level, you can, you okay. can get a smooth bounce. But you see, for a mathematician, it is fine. You, you don't continue. It's a well-defined function. We calculate observables in, a, in an honest way. No mathematician who knows about uh, generalized functions would object to the calculations we've done. Okay, thanks. Any further question? Please ask. No question. So I think there is no question. You have one more question. Your uh, microphone is switched off. Your microphone is switched off. Yeah. I know Robert for a long time and Robert has also written reference letter for me in various stages in my life. So I take the liberty, uh, since, since there are no other questions, I can also uh, pull, my, pull the leg of Robert and we do each other. So Robert, I have a one question. So <clears throat> among various brands, why are you choosing yes brand? Yes, yes brand does the job for you, but how will you tell the other brands not to exist when you are choosing the yes brand? Okay, so you see, I come from, we, we are starting from the effective field theory. Yes. In three plus one dimensions. Yes. We have a contracting universe. Yes. And then we, we are looking what, when does this effective field theory break down? And it breaks down at a particular time. Yeah. And you see, it is this, idea it breaks down when i say it breaks down at a particular time this is giving me the s brain so that the, it doesn't the, have the relation between the s brain and the unstable d brain yeah so any other unstable d brain will not be able to do the job but s brain will do yes i understand that but then we have to have also explanation about the non-existence of unstable D brains are not relevant, relevance of the unstable D brains at that time. Do you, are you able to explain that? Okay, so I think, let me translate what you said. So you, you, what you're saying is, okay, it's fine. I made an argument that you have to have uh, something new at this, when the energy density becomes string density. Yeah. Uh, and you are sort of challenging me. You are saying, well, I just took the simplest thing. Why isn't there, why, why shouldn't I have uh, gone back and asked what are all possible things I could have added? Exactly, exactly, that's my yeah. question. And I do, ha I do not have an answer to, 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 to oh. your question. So. Um, and that's fine with me, yeah. So anybody have any other questions? If not, I would uh, at least request all of you, those who are here, 
to unmute yourself and give a clap for Robert for giving such an uh, outstanding overview. So please, a lot, all of you, for listening and for your questions. It seems that everybody is sleeping. Well, if people are in India, it's it's late. Yeah, Robert. Uh, yes, I am in India. It's the dinner time. My wife is waiting downstairs for dinner, but I am not going because I was deeply engrossed in the talk. But I have a request for you. Yes. Um, my request is that I have not seen you in India. I don't know if you have ever come to India, but after my postdoc, when I came back to India, I have never seen you in India. And I'm the director of this institute called National Institute of Science, Education and Research. Of course, it's a bad time. There are no international fights, but as long as it resumes, can I request you to make a visit to my institute and address the, mine is a undergraduate as well as PhD together to, to spend few days with me in this institute and address to the students so that we can attract them to the field of cosmology. And if I tell, they will not listen. But if I can get you and you can talk to them, I hope they will listen. Uh, can I make this formal request to you? Uh, thank, thank you very much for the invitation. So, you see, I, I have not been to India since uh, 1996, I think. Oh. 1996, yeah. I, I came back after my postdoc to Harishchandra Research Institute in 93. So I don't know, maybe you came to TIFR or something or some other place. But for the time, I grew up with some sort of uh, uh, able to invite someone, etc. I have not seen you in India. And uh, I would like to you, as well as your family, to come over and be my guest. Spend some time. I mean, Bhubaneswar. Uh, in Odisha. You know, there is uh, going to be an online cosmology school in just a week from now, at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah, ICT. No, but I'm not talking about online. I want no, you to... There's also going to be a, a, a real version of the school, which is planned now for hmm. uh, January of 22. So there is a possibility that I will okay. be able to okay, that's January 22. Okay. Yeah, but as, and what I will do is that as soon as these international flights, etc., are operating, I will send you an invitation and you choose your time, come over with the family, spend some time without any worry about. Now one, one thing we can do now, we can yes. uh, like organize some uh, workshop or something on yeah, 20 I will, when... no, no, I, I will do that if he agrees, I will organize the workshop in yeah. my institute. But first, I will ask him that when he can come and that the time I'll organize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. If, that's what I'm, if he will come, I'm then we will organize the thing. At yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed even at this age. <laughs> thank you for your questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So at least give a clap for him. So... Uh, thank you, Robert, for your talk, and it will be uploaded in YouTube, and I will share the link with you. So be safe and healthy, and that's the main thing right now. That's right. So things will be perfect very soon, and uh, yeah, maybe we can see sometime uh, physically, not like virtually. Right, right. So, bye. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Bye. Thanks for listening, Lisa.